This isn't a religious war. It's a war whose roots are based in poverty, corruption. Central African Republic, for a time, went psychotic. You know, here we have a country that has 4.5 million people. It's a little bit smaller than the state of Texas. You know, it's 85% Christian or traditional animist beliefs, and 15% identify as Muslim. But here's how the people in the Central African Republic identify themselves. And I'm going to refer to Central African Republic by the shorthand that we sort of all default to, CAR. So if you're confused, that's, that's what I'm talking about. This is a map from a high school geography book. And it shows the ethnic groups. And there are more than 50 ethnic groups and subgroups. It's also a nation filled with treasure, literally. Fairly famous for its diamonds. One of the biggest diamonds ever found, almost 400 carats, was found in the CAR. It also has gold mines. Both of these resources are mined using artisanal methods. That means it's not an industrial scale thing. It's all like open pit mine digging like that. In recent years, uh, petroleum has been found up near the Chad border. And there's also deposits of uranium. France's first atomic weapon came from uranium that was mined in the CAR. It also has huge reserves of timber, game animals, but also uh, the potential for hydropower. So what went wrong? What, what happens? Usually this is the equation for, for prosperity, right? You have a fairly good-sized country with a relatively small population and all these resources. So, you know, why are we where we are today? And a lot of the answer has to lie at the feet of these men. These are the six leaders of the Central African Republic since independence. This is a, a monument in Bangui. It was erected in 2008, which was the 50th anniversary of independence. And each person on each one of these gold busts betrayed one of the guys up here. The guy that takes the cake of the leaders in terms of driving the country into the ground is this guy, Jean Bedel Bokassa. He was the uh, president for life and then decided that wasn't a grand enough title, so he decided to become the emperor of the Central African Empire. He was going to rename the whole country. He styled himself sort of the Napoleon of Africa. And in an era when we saw Muammar Gaddafi rise, Idi Amin was in his day, Mobutu Sese Seko was there, um, Bakasa gives them all a run for, them, for their money. He, um, he actually uh, met his nader when he decreed that all school children had to buy their school uniforms from, his, from a company that he owned. And when they had a, a, a rebellion or when there was a protest, he had 100 of them uh, arrested, and many were beaten, some killed. And that was sort of the moment that he, he, he met his downfall. Another issue that's been happening over the past 10 years or so, more than that, but 10 years is really the area that we focus on, is poaching the game, and specifically the, the forest elephants. Poachers have been coming into the CAR mostly from Sudan in organized fashion. Many of these are John Jaweed. In fact, one man described it to me as it's, it's an ivory bank account. We just come when we, need, when, we need, when we need money. In the past 10 years, I think they estimate 5,500 elephants have been killed um, for their ivory. And that's about 62% of the population. So only about 30% remain. The Seleka are a um, group of militias, predominantly from the north, Muslim-based, and funded by Chad to come and fight the Bozizi government. They were opposed by the anti balaka begun as a sort of a local neighborhood security force. When the Seleka rose up, these guys organized. They realized they needed some protection. Once the Seleka were gone, they took out reprisals on the Muslim population. They committed many of the same atrocities that the Seleka had committed. So that's not the whole story, though. That's just what's happening in predominantly the east and the north of the country. There's another conflict that's going on. Far away, over here in the far eastern corner, is a little village called Obo. It's a village of about 6,000 people. And in Obo, we don't have the Seleka. We don't have concerns about the anti balaka These are um, both Muslim and Christian children playing. These children are also under threat from another place, and that is, remember this guy? Joseph Coney rose to fame a couple of years ago with the Coney 2012 video that went viral. For those of you who don't know the story, he's a Ugandan warlord who, for the better part of the last two decades, has been um, 
kidnapping children to fight in his guerrilla army, and he's sort of moved from the DRC or from South Sudan to the DRC, and now he's um, found his way into the into the Central African Republic, and especially given this, the security situation that we've been facing um, in in CAR over the past um, year or so, he's, his forces have moved, you know, more forcefully into this area, but. What's keeping the people in Oboe um, safe for the moment is your tax dollars. This is actually a special forces, U.S. special forces base. It sits right on the corner of the village. And the U.S. has been there for three years now, actually, um, in part providing security, but in large part training Ugandan troops uh, and advising them on tracking Kony and his, war, and his, and his group. So these are the uh, Ugandan troops that they train. What's different, apparently, about this is that they're actually getting jungle warfighting training before they're sent, actually, to track Kony and his, and his men. And when I talk to people in the village, are they happy that these guys are here? They said, if the United States and Uganda wasn't here, Joseph Kony would be sleeping in oboe tonight. But I understand the human nature. You want to put some faces, on specific faces, on, on these issues. So I want to introduce you to three people. So the next time you see a random car uh, news report, a 500-word AP story, perhaps, you'll think of these three people. So this is Aramis. He was from Oboe. And he was kidnapped when he was 17 years old out of his grandfather's house and taken by the LRA into the jungle. He spent five years as a guerrilla fighter. He had horrible things done to him, and he did horrible things. Um, but he escaped about a year ago, and now he works with the U.S. and the Ugandans to broadcast um, radio messages into the jungle. And basically, they're trying to encourage the fighters to give, give themselves up, just, just like Aramis did. And that's been a pretty successful um, strategy. But so once a week, Aramis goes into the radio station and basically talks to his former comrades. And I sat in on one of his sessions, and you know he, he calls them by name, and he tells them, you know, you, you're, you know, your family wants you home. There's amnesty for anybody. The only guys that they're really basically going after these days are Coney and, and the other leaders. Another guy that I'd like you to meet is Albert. So Albert I met on a trip this summer to Bangui. And I barely had gotten you know, into the city, and he was knocking on my door, wanting to sell me something, you know, and kept saying, you know, I want you to buy these pictures. I've got these great pictures. You know, I was looking at the pictures, it's like a picture of a chicken, you know. I'm like, man, do I really want a chicken picture? <laughs> and, you know, I'm sitting there looking at this thing, and then I realized it's made out of butterfly wings. And I was blown away. And so he took me back to his workshop, and he showed me how he does these. He collects these butterflies meticulously and makes these stained glass images of life in the Central African Republic. Boy climbing a tree. And this picture has special significance because it's his sister. And she was killed by the Seleka earlier this spring. Lastly, I want to introduce you to the, uh, the National Ballet of the Central African Republic. They perform ethnic dances. So there's dances from all those ethnic communities that I show you, showed you. They're missing 14 of their members since the violence. And their rehearsal space has been completely destroyed. So they perform, um, they perform in a vacant lot in downtown Bangui. And, I happen, and, and people just come and watch. It's like free performances. And I happened to come by one day when they were performing this piece, which is actually a pygmy dance. And it tells the story of two women who were rivals for the affections of a man. And one of the women poisons her rival. And so an old healer is brought in to raise this woman from the dead. And this is the scene that you're going to see here.
So now I'm going to pass it over to Marcus. Thanks, Peter, for that. I think it's really important to highlight very early on in this uh, evening that this isn't a religious war. It's uh, a war whose roots are, are based fundamentally in poverty. It's based in corruption. It's based in mismanagement, bad leadership, many of which, you know, the leaders we were introduced to through Peter tonight. And, and religion has been used by the perpetrators to, to draw lines, to draw allegiances, and to, to, to try to create power. So I think we should try to rise above that this evening and try to think in a much more complex way about what is driving this conflict. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is to introduce you to the chronology of the conflict. It started, as we were introduced earlier on, that the Seleka were funded by uh, Idris Debi, Chad, to come in and destabilize the Central African Republic, maybe take resources, send those back to Chad, but also destabilize the Central African Republic um, for, the, for the benefit of its neighbors. And, and so this Seleka group that, was, that came into the country um, attacked the then government, took power from the government, and, and then started to rule over the population in a very uh, authoritarian way. And, and the people who suffered most under that very early Seleka rule were the Christians. They were the ones that were forced out of their homes because they were persecuted by the rebels that were working in different zones. And, and many of these uh, Selikas had gone kind of AWOL. They were funded to an extent by external powers. They were funded to an extent by their leaders. But they were also working for themselves. They were also trying to fund their own lives and their own, um, their own personal wealth gathering through uh, looting, through killing, through amassing wealth, through, uh, through stealing property. And that, and that insecurity of these Selika coming into the regions where predominantly Christian populations were living led the Christian population to flee into the bush. So I'd like you to try to kind of put yourself into that context when I show you the next series of images, because essentially the, these, the, the next series of images, I'm going to try and put you into that early stages as, as the Seleka is ruling and the Christian population has been persecuted and are fleeing. Uh, this is an image in a compound in a town called Bosangoa. It was taken in December 2013. And this is a mother trying to protect her child from the gunfire and the RPGs that are flying all around this compound as the Muslim Seleka are coming in to attack the town of Bosangoa, where there are about 10,000 Muslim refugees staying in the local school and about 30,000 Christian displaced staying in the church. This is a young girl who was injured in the fighting as she tried to flee to the Fomac base, which is where now I'm living with about 5,000 displaced people. The fight is ongoing outside the walls of this compound, and we're, we're there protected by a, uh, a small group of Congolese soldiers. This image was taken very early in the morning, about 5 o'clock, just as the sun is starting to rise, and normally about the time when if a town is going to be attacked, it is attacked. And this was the town, the time when the Seleka were coming into Bosangoa, and the local population had amassed around the Fomac base because they could feel it, they could hear it, they could... Villages like this, as small as they are, start to feel that there is something wrong quite early. And so this population is kind of waiting at the Fomac base to flee in so that they can get some sanctuary. And this is in the local hospital that was being run by Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontiers. And ironically, here we have on the right side an anti-Balaka fighter and his wife and child in the middle. And on the left side is a Seleka fighter, both sitting, lying, side by side, receiving the same medical care from the same doctor, and living in perfect harmony, as they had done before the battle, as their populations had done for many generations before. And children have played a large part in this conflict. And this young Seleka fighter was actually brought from Sudan. So he's Sudanese, came through Chad, and is now fighting in Central African Republic for the Seleka. And he's about 14 years old. Very few people really know their, their age, but 
very clearly he's underage. And both sides were using children and still are using children in the fight. We talk about Muslim and we talk about anti Balaka and the Christian and the animist population, but also there are a kind of cultural group called the Pearl, who are the nomadic herders, the people that look after the cattle. And they have enormous wealth all embedded in cattle. And they wander through this whole region. They wander through Cameroon, Chad, Central African Republic, and they follow the rains. As the rains move, they, the, they, they move their cattle, and the, the cattle graze, and they move through this whole region. They don't consider themselves from Central African Republic or Chad or Cameroon. They are from the region. And they were hugely persecuted by the anti balaka during this time because they were the source of beef. They were also predominantly Muslim. And so they were the anti balaka focused on them for that as well. And this young woman saw her, her whole family massacred around her. Her 12 children and her husband were killed. And she was shot in the back of the head and was left for dead. Uh, and she was only found by a group of pearl herders about five or six days later. And they brought her near dead to the hospital where she was um, cared for and, and survived. But she still has the bullet in the back of her skull. This is the church in Bosangoa, the displaced camp for the Christian population. About 30,000 people were there and are still there, actually. And this is a pearl lady who lost her husband. She lost five of her children. And the only reason she sat there with her young boy here was because she dressed him up as a girl and was allowed to leave the village that she was in because the group of anti balaka that she was with were not killing young girls. They were just killing boys. This is inside the church, the displaced camp. And the young girl in front you see here sat on the chair. She's 13 years old. She sat there with her daughter. And this is another issue that we have in Central African Republic. The concept of child marriage is, is, is prolific. And we came across it in every town that we went to, every displaced camp that we went to. For a lot of the time, the anti balaka were in these bushes hiding away like this. And then things changed. December came around, and the anti balaka started organizing themselves. And they became stronger to try and come and fight and engage the Seleka in a more active way. And the Seleka were told, you cannot treat your people with such disdain. You cannot treat your people with such hatred and expect them not to rebel against you. And time and time and time again, organizations, NGOs, human rights organizations told them this and they ignored it. And the anti balaka the Christian population came out of the bush. The anti balaka came out of the bush strong, motivated, and very, very angry. They started to rise up and attack the local population, sometimes the local Muslim population. Sometimes they were just taking things to try to enhance their strength and have their assets. This, of course, led to the local Muslim population and the pearl population, the nomads, to flee and to try to find sanctuary. And here we have a pearl population hiding in a Christian church, protected by the priest in that Christian church in this town is in Buali. And many of the priests in the churches all around Central African Republic were really sanctuaries for the Muslim population. They opened their doors in order to protect the Muslim population from their own Christian followers. This rise of the anti balaka led to the Muslim population deciding to relocate. This is a Muslim man. What happened when these enclaves were created is that the anti balaka then started picking off the Muslims on the edges, firing, throwing grenades, throwing RPGs, and slowly this Muslim population started to be killed. They were waiting there in these enclaves where people were trapped. They couldn't leave. They couldn't go anywhere. They were completely surrounded by anti balaka and there was no way out, safely no way out. And the United Nations, for much as though they were there to protect, they were also very fearful at the beginning to, to, to contribute and assist ethnic cleansing. And so these people were trapped in these zones and were being killed on a daily basis. This young man was demonstrating against the state that the Muslims were being held in and was shot by the French peacekeepers. And his wife, a few minutes later, finding out that her husband has been killed. As the Seleka started to leave, as the rise of the anti balaka increased, the Seleka started to decide to go. They started to kidnap people. 
and they started to take them to help them carry the baggage, much as the, though we see with the LRA carrying baggage to move it out of the country. Um, uh, many of the, the local population was kidnapped by the Seleka and to take them out of the country. And, and this actually is a, a man I met on the street about 50 kilometers outside of Bongi, and he'd been kidnapped by the Seleka. Spent nine days carrying baggage with the Seleka, being beaten every day to move quicker, move quicker, you know, don't stop because we need to leave this area very quickly because we're going to be killed. And, and he was being beaten to carry all the baggage. He managed to escape with his father. And we found him on the side of the road, emaciated and hungry and tired. And we put him in our car and, and brought him back to Bangui. And this is the moment, the very privileged moment that we have of, of taking him home and introducing him once more to his mother who thought he'd been killed. The Antibalaka rise up and continue to destroy the Muslim properties. And here we see one of the main colonels, Colonel de Giudone of the Antibalaka with his grigri and his grenades ready for the fight. And this is essentially what happened after that. The Seleka have now left Bongi. There is no one to protect the Muslim population. And so the, for a period of time between the last week in January, perhaps, and the middle of March, I, the way I describe it is that the country, for a time, went psychotic. There was killing on a scale I've never seen in 16 years covering conflict in Africa and imagery that I prefer really not to have in my mind. But it's important that we recognize that this happened. It's important that we understand the severity of this conflict and also the hatred that was for a period present in this area. This is a young man being lynched on the streets. He's a porter, a, a Christian porter, who was bringing supplies into a Muslim enclave so that they could eat. They would have flour to cook with and, and sugar to use for their tea. And as he came in, he was caught by the Muslim population he was serving and attacked and then beaten and then chased through the streets with machetes and bows and arrows. Thankfully, he escaped. Many, many more didn't. This young man actually is Muslim and is disabled and couldn't communicate that he was Muslim and so was beaten up to the point of almost death by his fellow Muslims. These are the reality of what happened day after day after day for six weeks in Bongi. I think I witnessed maybe 10 to 15 people being killed in front of my camera every day. The peacekeepers tried their best to keep the peace, but simply they couldn't control it. There weren't enough of them, and the capital, Bongi, was completely out of control. The Antibalaka throughout the country took control of whatever they could take control of and preyed on the remaining Muslims that were trapped in these enclaves, and they were picking them off one by one. And so what did that lead to? Some people call it ethnic cleansing. Amnesty International have called it ethnic cleansing. What is ethnic cleansing? Ethnic cleansing is where a group, a population, a targeted, very specific ethnic group are targeted by uh, an organized group. And it was very difficult to say at the beginning whether the anti-Balaka were organized, whether they were coordinated, whether there was a, a chain of command. It's since been proved, and they have admitted, that there is a chain of command within the anti-Balaka. And so maybe we can call it ethnic cleansing. But really, it's irrelevant what we call it, because the effect it was really the same. This is a Chad Special Forces soldier coming into Bongi to escort tens of thousands of people out of the region on these trucks. I stood there for maybe 45 minutes as truck after truck after truck loaded up to the extent that this one is loaded up, left Bongi with Muslims on board. This is a young father with a newborn waiting for the trucks to leave the center of Bongi. Many of these trucks were targeted by anti-Balaka on the road, and, and grenades were thrown into these trucks from the villages that they were passing through. So not everybody made it through. And the trip was hours, days to, you know, they were running the gauntlet of these anti-Balaka groups for days to get to Cameroon and Chad. I recently visited most of the Pearl population, hundreds of thousands of people that are seeking refuge in Cameroon. For the first time in 18 months, they feel safe. For the first time in 18 months, they have enough food. For the first time in a very long time, they have shelter over their heads. Their children can go to school. And so it was a very uplifting after such, after many, many months of hatred, many, many months of pain, many, many months of killing. I was starting to see the population that I'd known 10 years ago in Bongi. I saw the people that were making the butterflies. I saw the laughter again. I saw the children playing football again. 
all guarded by now the Cameroon military so that the anti balaka don't come across and start attacking the local population. The children, some of them, go to school for the first time. And they now live, as they lived in Central African Republic, in these camps in Kar. And H UNHCR, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, is doing actually a really, a really good job of integrating the refugee population with the local Cameroonian population so that there's, no, there's very little animosity between the two. So they go into a, a town and they bore 10 or 15 wells. They create 10 or 15 wells for the whole population, not just for the refugee population, but for the whole population. They build schools for the whole population, not just for the refugee population. So in a way, they are learning their lessons. They're becoming better at what they do. And, and this is a great example. We were very encouraged by what we saw there. There's a lot of talk about return, like when can these people return? But I asked all of these people, when did they want to return? If they wanted to return, and no one wanted to return. No one needed to return. And this is a really interesting concept for refugees. Should we force them at some point to return? Should we be really working for that end? And this is a really interesting question that we still don't know the answer to. Thank you very much indeed for listening.